Wednesdays in the Word, tonight we're taking a little bit of a different approach. Uh, this is going to assume that you already have a foundation in the Word, and we're going to kind of shift gears to talk about how to communicate things. All right, so usually this is more discipleship oriented. You're digging into scriptures, and this is, tonight's going to be a little bit different. We're going to talk about how to communicate those things that you already are experiencing and already know. Does that make sense? So uh, this is, we're calling this Becoming a More Effective Communicator. I wrote a guide to sharing just about everything at Hillside. Uh, not everything. This isn't like an official guide. You have to abide by these things. But I'm, I'm hoping to kind of shift our culture a little bit. One of the things that I love about our church, and especially right now, is that more and more people are getting up and sharing. We're becoming less of a one-person show where one person shares. And that means that all of us have more of an opportunity to share. But with that, I thought, you know what? I bet that there are some things that we can do to become sharper at our communication. Because sometimes you can lose people if you're bad at communication. And I don't want that to happen to any of us because I think what God's doing is too precious for us to lose it because of some communication uh, snafus, if that makes sense. So uh, the word communication comes from this Latin word meaning, or communicat, which means literally to make something common. Uh, it's, it means to share something. Uh, so it's not common as an ordinary that like everybody has, but something that you would maybe find in a commune, the exchanging or sharing of ideas, information. And I felt like this is really important for us because we share a community together. And again, this is going to be specific for Hillside. This isn't for every believer. This isn't for every setting. But again, I really felt like this is something specific for our church. So communication means make something common, sharing things together. And here's the thing is that we literally have the best news in the whole world to share. We have the best news out of everybody. The unfortunate truth is that people that have no news but can communicate well have an audience, right? There are a lot of celebrities that you and I could think of a name that have absolutely nothing to say, but yet people listen to them because they know how to communicate. And we can lose people with the best news if we lose, uh, if we lose them in our communication. Here's a tip for you. There's five Gospels that everybody can read, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and yourself. You are a living gospel to people. Uh, so I'm just going to ask someone tell me, what is the good news that we have? And give me like one sentence. What's the good news that we have to share? Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Yeah. What else? The truth of God. The truth of God. Jesus died for us. Jesus died for us so that we could live. Mm -hmm. Right? Have you ever seen people take that simple, powerful truth and then completely mess it up? Yeah, we all have. So that's, this is what I want to help, is how to communicate it more effectively. Here's my goal today, is to empower all of us to become more comfortable, confident, and competent in sharing what God impresses upon you to communicate. Do you like all those C's? Comfortable, confident, and competent. So that it's natural for you, so that you do it naturally and, and um, without having to like work things up, but it just flows naturally, and you know what to do in, in any sort of situation in your communication. That's our goal today. There's six things that I'm going to cover, and I'm going to go quickly, I promise. I took about 80 slides last night, and I whittled it down to about 20, because I realized it was way too much. So, you here's... You your audience, right? Exactly. So we're going to talk about what communication is and how it works. Uh, we're going to talk about how not to lose people. And then just some general recommendations about communication that I stole from someone else. I'll explain that. And then we're going to talk about how, what to do whenever you're sharing a testimony, what to do whenever you're prophesying over someone. And I, I mean also, like, you know how a lot of times a lot of people gather up and pray for people? How do you pray out loud for them? How do you know what God is saying and pray out loud and prophesy for them? And then if you're ever going to preach or teach, I just have like two minutes on that for you. So that's the gamut. It's the lot that we're going to cover. I'm going to try to go through it at a real um, tall scope. I'm not going to get too, too deep in it. So communication is a mix of three things, right? It's our words, our vocal elements, and our nonverbals. It's the words that we actually say, and then it's the way that we use our voice, and then it's our nonverbal, our, the way that our body communicates things. They, there was a study done, some of you may have heard this before, they found that what gets communicated 
only 7% of it is the actual words that you say. 38% is what gets said uh, through your voice, the inflections, but 55 is the nonverbal ways that we communicate. I'm going to give you an example. If I say to you, I've got to tell you what Jesus did in my life. Or if I say, i got to tell you what Jesus did in my life. Those communicate two very different things, don't they? What does the first one communicate? i got to tell you what Jesus did Something in my life. Bad. Something bad? Not very exciting. Excited. Not very excited. What about the second one? Yeah, a little more enthusiastic. A little more enthusiastic, yeah. <laughs> yes. Now, I want to ask you, when have you seen this to be true? Have you ever seen how nonverbal communication or vocal elements is at play in communication? When have you seen this to be true? When you're nervous and you can't, the person can't um, concentrate on the words because they're so nervous because they're standing in front of people. Yeah. They're like, ah, you draw a blank. Yeah, that's good. Anybody else? Tom, when you've seen this? You missed the question. When have you seen this to be true? Nonverbal communication. Craig? Well, I mean, what I was thinking of Thing that I learned was in email you only have number one so when you send emails to people you know in your mind what your your attitude what you're excited about what your emphasis is but the person receiving it will put their attitude their viewpoint on it and the, the same email can mean so much so many different things to different people because now all they have is the words and they're going to put into it they're a slant. Mm -hmm. And you, you can say, that's not at all what I meant. But anyway, I just wanted to share that. Yeah. Email is not a good way to communicate. Text messaging is the exact same way, right? <laughs> you can get a text that says, what time are you coming home? <laughs> is it a nice question or is it a, what time are you coming home? Angry question. Yeah. So there's all these other factors that go in besides just the words. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, the dean of my college had this saying that he was famous for. He said, words have meaning. And we would kind of laugh at him like, of course words have meaning. Uh, but here's an interesting fact. In your lifetime, the average person will utter more than 860 million words, which is the equivalent of speaking the entire text of that 20-volume Oxford English Dictionary 15 times. So we use our words a lot. And our words can either encourage people or they can tear people down. So words are absolutely important. Even though it's only 7%, the words that you say are really important. I'm gonna get a little bit ahead of myself, but I've seen people get up to share a testimony, and the one thing that they forget to say is the, like, the actual hinge of the testimony. This is what Jesus did. You know, in their nervousness, they miss saying with their words the most important thing. So our words matter. That's the biggest thing that I want you to take away from that. Um, so the rest of the communication is 93% is made up from our nonverbals. Tell me in this picture with these two people, what's being communicated by each one? Let's take the guy on the right. What's being communicated by his body position, that sort of thing? He's scared to death. Scared to death, yep. Timid. Timid. What else? He's close to listening to anything you have to say. Yep. He doesn't really want to be here either. Yeah. Do you think you want to listen to what he has to say? Probably doesn't have anything to say. <laughs> Probably doesn't have anything to say. How about the guy on the left? What does his body posture say? He's ready to talk. He's ready to talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's, he's opened up. He's opened up. He's confident. I'm, I'm reading this book right now. It's called Captivate, and it goes into like all the social or all the science of the way that we speak, and it's fascinating. And what they found is that people make an assumption about college professors, or let me back up. They took videos of college professors, and they showed them to people, and they found that people made an assumption about that professor within 10 seconds, just from their body posture and the way that they looked. The sound was off, so just the way that they were standing. And then they thought, let's shorten it and see if we can get um, the same sort of judgment. So they shortened it to five seconds, and they found that still in five seconds, 
people made an assumption, or they judged, whether or not the professor was going to be good. And then they shortened it to two seconds. And they found that people within two seconds made a judgment about whether or not this professor was going to be good. All right, so what that says is that sometimes we judge people within two seconds whether or not we want to listen to them. Then what they did was they took the same professors and they followed students' assumptions of them from the beginning of the semester to the end of the semester. So now that they had spent four months with them, what did they think? Do they still think the same things or did that perception change? And they found out that it didn't change. It didn't? It did not change. So that their perception was locked in within a few seconds of seeing someone. So that means that the way that we come across physically makes a big difference. Wasn't that what Donald Trump said about knowing Un? Yeah. Either within the first, I mean, he would know. Whether or not he was serious? Yeah. I think I did hear that. Yeah. He, you know, he was, everybody was saying, how oh, presumptuous of him. <laughs> yeah. One other interesting fact, um, they, the same book, they looked at athletes and athletes that were blind since birth. And they found that athletes that lost, they exhibited a body posture where their shoulders were slumped down and they looked disappointed. But athletes that won, instinctively, they raised their head up, they raised their arms up in this winning pose, even though neither of them had ever seen anyone ever do that. So what they're saying is that the body posture of someone who communicates confidence is the same whether you've seen it or not. Our body just knows how to communicate confidence. And it's with kind of your shoulders up looking out and straight versus communicating that you are uh, not confident means that your shoulders are slumped and looking down a little bit. Give me some feedback on this. What do you think of all this? Have you seen this to be true? Do you want to push back on it? What do you think? You're nodding your head I yes. I would agree. I think it's unfortunate. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's the thing is that you could have the greatest message in the world, but if you come across like you're timid, people aren't going to pay attention. Or the other way, you, you come off looking too, too, confident. too confident and they break you off. Yes. Because you're cocky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now my goal for today is not that you memorize how to, how to physically present yourself in any situation. I just want to try to help push us as a church a little bit more this way into communicating confidently. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So don't feel like, oh my goodness, what if I forget and I don't exhibit the right body posture sometimes. That's not my point. Barb will let us know. Barb might let us know. <laughs> All right. Um, so we're going to move on. That's just a real primer on the way that communication works, and it's a mixture of all those three things. Now we're going to talk about how not to lose people. Now. How not to lose people. Donald Miller. Now not. Yes, it's now not. Oops. How not. Whoops. <laughs> How Not to Lose People. Donald Miller, he wrote two New York Times best-selling books. Uh, he's the CEO of this company called StoryBrand. Um, he has this quote, and it's so simple, but it's so powerful. He says, if you confuse, you'll lose. If you confuse people, you will lose them. So here's my question. What are some ways that we can confuse people when we're communicating? In our setting, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, or maybe on a Sunday morning or in a small group, what are some ways that we can confuse people and then they kind of lose focus or lose track of what God's trying to do in the moment? Is he assuming you know the background? You'd love to share something, and if you start at the end of the story, a lot of people aren't aware of the beginning of the story. Yeah. So like for the day when James comes, if you just get up and say, James is here. <laughs> 75% of the people in the room may, may know that. 25% won't know any of the story, and some people may have forgotten the story. So when that day comes, we'll say, here's James. We've been praying for him for this many months, and the paperwork came through, and he is here in our midst, and he's your adopted grandson from Liberia. You'll tell the whole story. Right? Amen. 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 Yes. All right. What are some other ways that we can confuse people when we're communicating? too much information that is not related to the story. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Too much information. Yes. People start to snooze. How is this? Why do I care about this? How is this relevant? Yep. I wrote down not getting to the point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So I'm going to give you, and this is part of the reason we're in here, I want to give you a real practical example. This is worship music from Sunday. The song's going to end. We're going to talk about what happens next. What happens next? Somebody comes up to say something. Yeah, oftentimes. Sometimes we're just waiting. And that's okay. And I think that we try to help that happen. A lot of the musicians maybe play real quietly in the background. Things like that. I thought you were asking us to remember what happened. Oh, no, no, no. (laughs) No, I'm not. But sometimes I've seen this before. Like, let's say someone's (laughs) supposed to give an announcement or something. And this is what happens. The song ends. And they're way back here. Oh, the song ended. So they slowly make their way up. Is anybody confused? Like, what's going on now, right? Because there's, there's a lot of time between what was happening and what is. Now, they, now people come up here. Hello, can you hear me? Right? Now people are paying attention, but... Have we confused them a little bit? Yeah. I think you're confusing your audience because they have no idea what you're doing. I know, that's true. <laughs> so if we want to confuse people, then we will not, then we will ignore transitions. Like we won't be anywhere near where people are looking. But if we want to keep people, if we don't want to confuse them, then if you're going to get up to share, then you're going to be right up front, ready to go. So that Pastor Steve or whoever's leading the service or the worship leader You can make eye contact, and you can go right to that spot. Now, a lot of times people don't want to come up here, right? Because this feels awkward. I'm higher than everybody else. And sometimes we can feel like, I I don't deserve to be elevated above other people. But this isn't about that. This is about people being able to what? To, To see me, right? So it is absolutely okay to come up here. This is why I come up here. I'm short. People can't see me if I'm down front. I'm not up here because I want to be seen, per se, but just so that people aren't lost if I get up. So it is okay to come up here. And let's just talk about this thing for a minute, the microphone. Um, The guys in the back are really on it. And so you flip this little button up, this little button right here. It's going to go from red to green. And when it's green, you're good to go. If you, if you feel like you need to check something, you can tap your finger on it. You can hear that quietly. But, yeah. But as soon as you go, am I on? Then people are thinking, why wouldn't you be on? Like, is there a problem? So feel free to come up. If this isn't on, just flick it on and then start talking. But people can't hear you if the microphone's down here. Do you guys remember the baptism we had two weeks ago? And the pastor from the other church, he was praying for people. Could you hear what he was praying? No. No. Did he have a microphone? No. I had this, and I tried to put it in his face. But he didn't want the microphone on. And so we all missed out. I could hear him, but we all missed out on what God was saying to the person, right? Yeah. It's the same thing whenever any of us comes up to share. So you want to put it basically at your chin. I've heard Todd say, think like you are eating a snow cone. <laughs> So put it right here, because down here, you can't hear it, but up here, you can hear it. So put it here. You don't need to eat it, um, but you right, right on your chin. between uses? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's licking it. That we don't. That we, yes. I sure hope not. That'd be gross. So if you're ever, if you ever feel like you have something to share, and let me also say this, um, one of the best things you can do is come talk to Pastor Steve or whoever else is up here and say, I I feel like I'm getting this picture, this scripture, this phrase. I don't know if this fits in with what God's doing right now, but I just wanted to share it with you. That's awesome. We love that. So come and share that with us. And then if, if we feel like, yes, the Holy Spirit's on that for all of us, sometimes it's just for you. It's something that God is doing in your own life. And you need to just meditate on that because God's speaking something to you personally. And that's awesome. Sometimes it's for all of us corporately. 
So come and talk with whoever's up here kind of leading the service about it. Does that make sense? And then if, if you're invited to share, then feel free to come up. Sometimes during worship, I, I understand people want to stay down here, but especially if you're giving an announcement, then come on up where people can see you and hold a microphone so the people can hear you. All right, so stand where you can be seen and speak so that you can be heard. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, all right, we're going to shift into the general overall recommendations. Has anyone ever heard of a little church called Hillsong before? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they've written like 50 albums and they, they've got quite an influence. They have um, churches in like 27 countries right now. It's pretty crazy. Uh, in June of 2016, I saw this article that the senior pastor put out uh, and it was called 30 Rules for Communicators. And what was interesting was he gave it to the entire staff, not just to those that preach or teach on a Sunday morning, but to the entire staff. Why do you think he would want to do that? This is at the bottom of the first page. What, what's the benefit of giving it to everybody, even if those people are probably never going to preach on their stage in that huge auditorium? Why would he give it to the whole staff? Still communicating every day with them. It's a hundred or five or... Absolutely. Yep. Communication doesn't just happen from a pulpit. We communicate all the time. That's right on. So, I thought about giving you all 30. That's what I've been looking for, though. And 30 was way too overwhelming. So, if you are curious what they are, you can Google. I wrote it down, what the title is. You can Google it later. I just wanted to give you a few that I thought were uh, important for us to focus on, if that makes sense. So, oh yeah, there's Hillsong. That's the picture that goes with the article. Number one, this is tip number one they wrote, every communication is positive. So that every communication that we give to people is positive. I think, I mean, all of us, we are looking to be encouraged. And here's the thing is that what God wants to say to us is positive, even if it's judgment. It's judgment for the sake of redemption, right? So if God is going to speak something that's harsh and needs to get cleaned out of our lives, the point isn't you're so filthy, you're a mess, period. The point is that you need, we need to work on this so that you can have a healthy and full life in Christ. So everything that we say should have a positive tone to it. It shouldn't come across negative. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. What do you think? Joel, I see your face. What are you thinking? You can push back. I manage 75 staff, and when I call them in, it's difficult at times to put a positive spin on things. Absolutely. I I see for for a good employee, it works very well. Yeah. I totally understand that. And that's where this, where I'm thinking, like, our context. Yes. uh, Absolutely. That's what I have in mind for this. I, I agree. Yeah. One of the most crucial times of the service, if you think about it, is the opening, like when we welcome people, and if we come across really negative, man, that just sets a negative tone for the whole day. But if we come across like, God is here, God's in the midst, and we're so excited for what he's going to do today. This is what he's already been speaking to us, and we're looking forward to what he's going to do in our midst. That's positive, and that sets a positive tone for everything. I can't imagine standing up here and saying, well, we're glad to see that you're here today, that you made it, that you got here on time. You know, people get up and leave, you know. Right. <laughs> that would be... Yeah. <laughs> right. But having a positive tone is huge. So, that's number one. Every communication is positive. Number two is that it has a set time limit. Now, I'm going to back this down a little bit. Uh, this doesn't mean, like, if you get up to share something, a uh, picture that God gave you, that you've got 30 seconds, and at 30 seconds, your time's up and you're done. I'm not saying that, but I am saying that sometimes we can share too long. Like Liz mentioned earlier, you can give too much information and lose people. So just be mindful of time and how time passes. Uh, Sometimes we've had people uh, that give announcements. We've had missionaries come, and they talk for 10, 15, 20 minutes about one announcement, and the kids are going crazy, the kids are loud, and then everyone is not paying attention anymore. Have you ever seen that happen before? Yeah, so just be mindful of how much time you have. If you're going to give an announcement and Amber says, like, all right, you've got two to three minutes, then keep it to that time frame. I would even suggest I practice things ahead of time and I'll time myself 
so that I know how much time I have. I'm not saying do that for everything. I don't want you to think that. But just be mindful of time passing. Does that make sense? There's a clock back there. It's not super big, but if you want to, you can keep an eye on it. I can't really even see it very well right now. But. And we'll help you. I mean, Pastor Steve, he's, he's kind of come in before and help people if they're ever getting too long. So just be mindful of time. Uh, number, tip number seven is that it's focused on helping. Sometimes people will get up and they'll talk about uh, themselves a lot. And so there's a more of a focus on them or there's a focus on their past and all the sin and all the negative stuff. But I think that our communication should be focused on helping people find Jesus, right? So everything should be focused on helping people grow. Number 14, I love this one. It's reflecting what we are for, not against. I've heard uh, another pastor, Mark Batterson, one of my favorite authors, he has said, I want to be more known by what I'm for than what I'm against. And so we can take lots of issues. Um, gay marriage, for example. We can come out and say, gay marriage is sinful, it's wrong. We could say that, and that's absolutely true. But I would rather say, God's design for marriage is between a married man and a woman. And I think that, that you're communicating the same thing, the same truth, but you're communicating a positive rather than a, a sense of judgment. You can turn people off really quickly by talking about what you're against. You can say the same message by talking about what you're for. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. I think there's only two more. Number 20 is it exalts Jesus and brings glory to God. Everything that we say should be pointing people to Jesus. And we live in a world where God is kind of an okay thing to talk about, and God can mean many things. I have family members that are in uh, AA and other programs, and God can mean lots of different things, not only Jesus Christ. So I think it's important for us to point people to who God really is, and it's to Jesus. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, and then number 25, left behind on Monday. Now, this, this wording is for if you're for someone that's speaking on a Sunday morning but that you leave it behind. You don't go back to it afterwards and think, oh, did I say that right? Like, beat yourself up about what you said. Did I say the right things? Man, what if that really made no sense? What if that discouraged them? I don't want you to walk away from any of this feeling like you need to judge yourself or beat yourself up about what you say. So you, you say it, you submit what you feel like you need to say, and then you let it go. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, all right, last one, is that you're aware of the audience. And we talked about this a little bit, that there are often, almost every Sunday, there are new people here. There are people that uh, have never been here before and they don't know people. So one of the marks of a small church is if you say, hey, this Sunday after church, we're going over to, to Megan's house. And then from there, we're going to go to Craig's house to jump in the pool. People that are new have no idea who those people are. So if you ever reference someone... You can ask them to raise their hands, stand up, point to them. Um, also, we're, we stream services on Facebook, and it's been pretty cool. I substitute in the schools, and I found, I've talked to some kids. Greg, one of those wily seventh grade boys that was here years ago that we had problems with in worship, he said, oh, I watched your church on Facebook. I watched for about five minutes the other day. And what's wild is that we don't know who's watching, and so we don't, we don't really know the audience. But... Something to keep in mind at the back of your head is that we have a big audience of people that could be watching. And so keep that in mind in your communication. Don't use insider language that only people that have been here for a long time know, but introduce people, introduce stories, that sort of thing. Does that make sense? Okay. Do you see why I didn't give you all 30? That's just seven of them. All right, so give me some feedback on these seven. What do you think? What are some that maybe you want to push back against? What are some that you think are really helpful? What are some that you've seen done well or poorly before? Or maybe even one that you thought was really meaningful. Tip number 25, where it says, just leave it behind. Don't be reliving it in your head. 
you get stuck on a relationship that fits differently or you allow other voices to say, well, you shouldn't have said that at all. And then you devalue the work that God is doing through what you said. You get lost in the feedback from that and just seeing how it's working out and not being stuck in your head with, well, I should have said this differently or stood differently or smiled more. You're your own worst critic. It's like you can shut that voice up real fast. It's better. Yeah. I'm going to, I agree with that. I'm going to give a tip that sounds counterintuitive, but I think helps. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've done recently is I've gone back on Facebook and I've watched uh, the two or three minutes when I've gotten up to share, and I realize that I often stick my hands in my pocket, mm -hmm. which I realize is, doesn't communicate confidence. It communicates like I'm really laid back. Uh, it doesn't really communicate that I know what I'm doing as much. So sometimes going back, if you want to evaluate and what you're doing is you're quieting all those other ideas and you're just taking one look at it, it can be helpful. So I've, I, now that I realize that, and some of you nod your head because you realize that about me and I didn't know. So now I realize that and I try to not stick my hands in my pocket and I keep them out. Uh, I've heard some people say, I don't know if there's truth in this, but that back when we uh, were more of the caveman style of living, that if you couldn't see someone's hands, then it meant that they were a threat. Do they, you know, are they hiding a rock, a club, that sort of thing? So when you hide your hands, it makes people feel unsure and unsafe. I don't know if there's truth in that, but it kind of makes sense. Yeah. Because you don't have a fist. <laughs> yeah. Well, if I did, you wouldn't know, but yeah. <laughs> Any other feedback from that list of seven? Are you glad I didn't give you all 30? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, good job. Cool. All right. So we are done with the first half. We're probably going to be done before 8. Uh, and we're going to get into testimonies, prophesying, and preaching, and teaching. So for testimonies, this is on the back side. Uh, in Acts chapter 26, Paul really gives us an incredible outline, and it's very simple, for a testimony. And he gives this to King Agrippa. King Agrippa asks him why he's there, and he tells his whole story. And he tells about how, bef how in the beginning he used to persecute people that were believers, how he, he went after them house to house and he threw them in jail. Then he talks about meeting Jesus and how meeting Jesus changed everything. And then he talks about his life now and what that looks like and how he is serving and giving his life for the gospel. If you're familiar with the book of Acts, you'll probably remember this whole story. And in Acts 26, he lays that out specifically. And really every... Oh yeah, here's a tip for you. Read the story sometime in the next few days. If you want to, review Acts 26, and you'll see this. But every testimony has these three elements. It has a before, it has the change, and Jesus is the change. Jesus is the reason why things change. And then there's after. I'm going to give you a couple different examples from my own life. Uh, I gave you Paul. I used to persecute, persecute Christians. Jesus appeared to me, blinded me, healed me, and now I serve him with my whole life. Very simple. My life testimony is that I grew up in a, a great Christian home, but I struggled to own my own faith for a while until I was about 15. And then at that, at that time, I was on a mission trip and just angry at God, completely angry. And God wrecked me with the, with the truth that no matter how much I tried to run from him, that nothing would ever change how much he loved me. And then after that, I surrendered my life afresh to Christ. That's the 15-second version of my testimony. But it works not just with your life testimony. It works with little testimonies, too. Sometimes things are big. Um, I probably have told the story before, but in our first year of marriage, we were in a really difficult spot financially. Um, Abby didn't have a job. She had a job that she was working for her college, and it went crazy. She was supposed to work on weekends, and I wasn't supposed to go with her, and she was going to be gone all the time. And we had just gotten married, and her boss was really mean and controlling. I hope you're not watching on Facebook. Um, <laughs> and so we decided it would be best for her not to continue. So she didn't have a job. Uh, both cars needed new clutches. Our rent was coming due. We didn't have money. And I remember f getting ready to go to church and just feeling so defeated. And I thought, that's it. I'm going to go give plasma <laughs> to pay the rent. I just, I was so frustrated. We walked into church and before anything even happened, we didn't start any songs. The pastor just said, I feel like people are struggling financially and I want to pray for you today. And so my wife pulled me along and I was like, no, 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 that's not us. <laughs> I realized that it was. We used to live together. Yes. <laughs> and that day we walked out, people paid to fix both cars. They gave us money for a rent that was due. People took us grocery shopping. 
and our, our, to this day, our cupboards have never been that full. Mm -hmm. And it was a moment that changed when Jesus spoke and, and I humbled myself and allowed him to come in. So every testimony, my life one, that one that I just told you, has a before, before we were really struggling in a mess. Jesus showed up and changed things, and after, not that oh, I, we've never struggled, we absolutely have, but now I have a trust that Jesus can provide more than I can. So every testimony has that. And I left space in there, and I want to challenge you, maybe even tonight, since we'll probably be done early, take a few minutes to write out a testimony. Here's what happened before. Here's what my life was like. Here's what was going on. Here's the dysfunction that I couldn't fix. And then here's when I met Jesus, and Jesus changed everything. And then the after, here's how things are different. That's what a basic testimony looks like. Any thoughts or feedback on that? Have you ever thought about your testimony in this way before? Not that simplified, no. Okay. Keep it simple, stupid, right? <laughs> oh, sorry. Keep it simple, sweetie. I, I will probably remember that, Barb. Uh, so this is where I had a bunch of slides, and I really tried to back it down. Uh, prophesying, whether it's up in front to everybody, or really I was thinking more of the context of like this past Sunday, we said, if you're struggling with something, raise your hand, people will come around and pray for you. How do you know even what to say, what to pray for people? That's kind of what I wanted to address. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about. First thing is that you can ask somebody why they want prayer. Tell me what's going on. Like, man, you raised your hand. What, what's going on in your life? So if you hear that, then you can pray. Someone says, I'm really struggling with finances. I just feel overwhelmed in life. Then you can pray. God, would you bless this person? Lord, I pray that you would bring peace to this stressful situation in their life. Um, or if you don't have to ask them, or you may not ask them, or just in general, something may come to mind when you come around them and you start talking to God. God, I, I pray for Liz, and just start thinking about Liz and about what God wants to do in her life. And you may get a picture. It could be like a scene. Uh, it could be like a moving picture, like a video, something that kind of plays out in your mind. It could be a phrase or like words. Uh, sometimes it's just a hunch, like an intuition, like I feel like this is going on. Sometimes it's a short thought, or sometimes you just have like a knowing, like ah, I, I can't explain it, but I just know that this is the situation. So that's the basic of like understanding what God is saying. And then what you do is you share what you see. And here's an important thing is that you only share what you see sometimes we can get into trouble when we see uh, a picture of a battle going well oh, i'm trying to think of a better example if you if you see a picture and then you share more beyond what you see then you can get into trouble but just share the part that you see because that will make that may make most sense to them and you can invite them to process that part with jesus i'm trying to think of an example of this some of you are nodding your head. What do you think? Give me some feedback. Megan. At the youth retreat a um, few years back, Joanna had gotten a picture of a cactus. And she's like, I have no clue what that means, and here it is. And for me, that was the connecting piece that I would be at Valley Forge <laughs> for however long God had me there, and potentially Arizona. <clears throat> so so like, she didn't know, but she just told me the words that she saw and left it at that. Yeah. That's awesome. Because if she started to give you an interpretation of that, mm -hmm. then that would have made no sense to you. Mm -hmm. But the cactus itself makes sense. <coughs> okay. So if something comes to mind, then share that. And I will tell you that the more that you practice it, the more that you go over and pray for someone, sometimes just putting your hand on their shoulder, if they're comfortable with that, helps too. But the more that you practice, then the more that you'll grow in seeing or hearing these things. <coughs> the more you practice, the easier it will come. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, some things to watch out for. I don't really like to use the phrase, God told me. That's such a strong statement. Paul says that we see things in part. We see through a mirror dimly. And so I feel like I, I don't have 100% clarity on what I feel like God is saying. So I would say, I feel like God wants you to know this. Or I sense that the Holy Spirit might be doing this in your life. I really try to stay away from God told me. Because if you say God told me, 
you can't really argue with that, right? Because if, it, if it's really God, then I don't want to argue with that. So I prefer to use just the language, I feel like, I sense that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Dates and mates, this is one that I've heard people say before, is to stay away from dates and mates. Uh, if you're gonna, if you feel like you understand something about someone's future, uh, dates, man, if, if that date comes and goes and nothing happens, people can get so disappointed. And same thing with a mate. Sometimes people will come up and say, God told me that I'm supposed to be your spouse. Well, <laughs> God didn't tell me that. So hold on there, buddy. Um, so those are two things that you really got to be careful for if you sense them, dates and mates. And then if you sense any sort of sin issues or some sort of negativity that's going on in someone's life, you don't want to share that with them. I'll give you an example. If you're praying for someone and you feel like they've got a struggle with alcohol addiction or drug addiction or pornography, you don't want to say, man, I see that you are hitting that bottle hard every night. What you would say, you would flip it to the positive. If you sense like someone has an issue with pornography, you would say, God wants to instill such purity in you, such holiness in you, so that there isn't any issues in your life anymore. So if you get a sense that something sinful is going on, prophesy or pray for the positive side of it. Isn't that what God's heart is anyways? Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to condemn us. His heart is to bring redemption to us. All right. Any thoughts or feedback on this part about praying for people prophesying? Any questions you have? Okay. I'm going to go through this quickly. If you're ever preaching or teaching, and, and really in any level whether it's with kids or any, any kind of situation, I think it's, there's something that's really helpful to think through. Uh, my first few sermons, by the way, they had really excellent content. People would come up and say, can I have your notes? That was so good, but it was so boring. It was absolutely horrible. It was like reading a commentary. It was rich, but utterly uh, forgettable. So these, these are some things that I've learned. Um, I like to think through a couple questions that I've heard uh, Andy Stanley mention. There's five of them. Is what do people need to know? And then the second one is a follow-up from that. Why do people need to know it? What's the, what's the one thing? What's the burden on your heart? What's the passion that God has given you? In this lesson, what's the one thing that if people only, if the kids only remember one thing, what is that one thing that they need to remember? And whatever that is, why? Why does that matter? What is the difference that knowing this is going to make in someone's life? Those are the first two. And then the third thing is about application. What do people need to do? What's the one thing that people need to go home and do? And then the fourth is, why do they need to do it? All right. So whatever application there is, what difference will it make if they go and do this thing? What difference will it make in your life if you go home and write out your testimony? Well, the difference is that you'll be able to share that a lot quicker with someone if you take the time to prepare that ahead of time. The fifth one, the last one, is what can I do to help people remember it? There's lots of different ways. I don't really want to get too much in the weeds to this. One of the best things that you can do to help people remember things is to repeat it over and over and over. Say it over and over and over. Those are five questions just to think through if you're ever going to teach. And a tip is tell a story. We rarely remember an outline, but we remember stories, right? Probably one of the things to remember most from tonight was not any of those rules from Hillsong. You might remember the story about when Abby and I were first married and we're in a financial crisis. People remember stories, so look for a way that you can tell the story of what God wants to do. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's all I got. So my hope and prayer for all of us is that we would continue to practice communicating and that we would grow in it and that we would grow in our ability to hear and speak what God is saying. Good. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Craig. Just on a more personal